Coming up on iPads in the Classroom, it's faculty apps. Hi, my name is Guy Training, and this is iPads in the Classroom from TechEdge. And today I want to talk about some apps that can help faculty as they're starting with iPads, especially it is important if your students are coming in with iPads for the first time or maybe they've been using them for a while and you want to find what are the best ways to use that. So today I'll talk about a few ways you can use it yourself and next time talk a little bit about what students can use um, as well. And one thing that you can do with the iPads that is very useful is to communicate with students, especially if you've got students who are not on campus or are not on campus at the, at the moment. And so we talk about the time when students come into our office. They can also come digitally into our office. And there are a few versions that we can do to have that happen. And the first one that we can have is using Google Hangouts. And the reason I like using Google Hangouts is because Google Hangouts work on all devices, whereas, and we'll talk for a second about FaceTime. FaceTime is, an, is a communication that works mostly uh, through Apple devices. So if your students and you all have Apple devices, you're fine. But if you're the only one with an Apple device and you don't know what your students have, it is safer to go with things like Skype or in our case Hangouts, that allow you to do this across. So what you can see in Hangouts is that uh, I have the people I've talked to recently. These are people in my list, and these are the active Hangouts that I've had. You have a contact list with everybody that you've contacted before and anybody that you put on your uh, Google list. You, you log into Hangouts the same way you log into all uh, of your Google Apps. And so once you have that, you can uh, communicate. And you can see that you can communicate also verbally. So you can make a call, or you can send a message, and you can even attach pages uh, and documents to it. So there's lots of options if you want uh, to go uh, forward. Um, all you do to communicate with somebody is, um, let me see. Here, here, I get the profile for uh, John and then uh, the post he's made. But I can also make a call right now and say, let's call. And that's got phone numbers and all of that. Or you can communicate with his Google account as well. Uh, you can make, now I'm contacting him. And he's probably going to answer, so we're going to stop that. Uh, right now and you can reverse the camera so you can see you can mute you can turn on and you can reverse the camera so you've got a back facing camera and I disconnected before he answers and that's the way you work in Google Hangout so that's a way to do meetings with your students online you can do the same thing with FaceTime and if you have a Skype account I would definitely use Skype so there are multiple apps that can do this they're each a little bit different but at the heart of this is that you can have a video conversation with your students as long as both sides have enough bandwidth. If there isn't enough bandwidth on one side or the other, usually the best choice is to turn off the video and see if that makes it better. Um, at that point, of course, the main advantage of that communication over, let's say, talking on the phone is that you can also text, use text, and send files with it, which is a major help if you're working with a student and you're looking at uh, common documents, uh, work, or anything else. So this is one thing is communication. The second thing, and this is really important and I've talked about it a number of times uh, before, is making sure that you have a link to your learning management system. Or in our case, it's Blackboard. It can be Canvas or uh, Moodle or anything else. Make sure that you have an app that allows you to uh, get all of that information. Uh, in the case of Blackboard, what's best about Blackboard is not necessarily what, uh, what you can do on it as an instructor, but it is a great way to go in, read discussions, make sure everything is visible and looks right for your students, and uh, do some responding, emailing, and all of that. You can see 
you can look at the different things you've created. In my case, I've got a class with different modules. You can see what the modules include. Uh, you can go and look at the discussion board and see what different students posted and respond to them. A third use that is uh, uh, the obvious use um, is to read text, especially textbooks. I hate carrying my textbooks around, but I do want to know what's on them. So I use CourseSmart and your textbook rep, if you have one, will be happy to download a digital text straight for free into your course smart. So if you're an instructor and you want to look at new textbooks or you want to have your textbooks, textbook in a digital format, you can. And this is a textbook I used to teach with or I still teach with, Analytical Reading Inventory. So you can see you can read it. Uh, you can go to specific pages. You can make notes. You can highlight a piece of text and make notes uh, like that. So you can actually annotate the book. And uh, you can switch books, so you can see these are books. Most of my books are actually online, and I download them only when uh, I have a class that uses that book. That allows me to have a lot more than I can actually handle on my, uh, on my iPad. And what I love about CourseSmart is that if my students are still using a paper version, this is exactly the same as the paper version. So this is the paging, the paging and all of that does not change as you move between the uh, paper version and the online version, uh, allowing me to quote the right pages and allowing me to understand where my students are. So this is a great option. It's called Course Smart. The last thing I want to talk to you is about presenting information and all of the presentation software that you can use on your computer, you can also use on your iPad. So for example, if you do create Prezi's and that's a way you share some of your information, you can go to Prezi on the iPad and get the same kind of information. And I'm going to log in here quickly to my account. And again, what I love about this is it's saved across devices, so it doesn't matter if you have that or not. And here are the presentations that I've made recently. And if I want to choose one of them, all I have to do is press. You see it's downloading. So these are living online, but I'll show you in a second. You see this is the presentation. This, it works the same way that it'll work online, except that all you have to do is touch one side or the other to move it ahead. So you can see this Prezi. And here is, you can edit it on, on the device as well. And you can do a lot, although it's not as many options as when you have on a computer. But you can, on the fly, create a wonderful Prezi just on the iPad. Another thing that you can do, which is important, is you can actually keep those on the device. So you can make sure that you're downloading specific Prezi's into your device so you're not dependent on your wireless connection or whatever connection you have. And we all know that it, everything works until it doesn't work. So this is a way to make sure that if you have your iPad, you can present even if you don't have Wi-Fi at that moment or something happens. It's a great way to think about making sure that whatever you need is there at that moment. So this is using Prezi. There is the, uh, the app that Apple has produced, Keynote. And I love Keynote because it's a very streamlined presentation software. And um, it, it, it can take your PowerPoints and turn them into presentation. By the way, Prezi can do that as well. So you can see that I have a large connection of Prezi's. And you can organize them in folders and uh, for just better organization, and then you can quickly uh, bring them on. Whatever projects on the screen, if that screen is connected to your projector, will be able to uh, actually share with the students. And here's something that is very important to know. There are two ways to connect your iPad to uh, the projector. One is to connect it with a cord. There's a cord that goes from the bottom of your iPad and can connect to a VGA connector or even to an HDMI connector that will connect to a projector. And you need to make sure that you know what your projector can take. HDMI is always better, better quality. But if you're not getting um, that connection on your uh, projector, it really doesn't matter. 
Uh, the second thing that you need to know is that you can connect it wirelessly and there are lots of options but you have to explore them carefully because depending on what the way the technology is set up in your campus they may or may not allow you to connect uh, wirelessly so check with your technology uh, support people and make sure that uh, you can do that and that they help you make it happen so this is another way to project and share information with your students. So we talked today about three ways that you can work with students if you've got an iPad and hopefully if they have an iPad too, but right now it's enough that you do. And one way was to connect, uh, to connect with your students at a distance using multiple apps. The second way was to use your learning management system to share information or uh, to work with your textbooks. Uh, through CourseSmart and the last way is by using presentation software and presenting the materials to them. Some of these things are just replacing old way, you know, still using PowerPoint. Prezi is a step up from that and does it more interestingly and with more options. But communicating at a distance and learning management systems are definitely things we couldn't do before and they really present us with new opportunities to work with students when they're in the field or where they're even uh, far away from us. And I'll see you next time on iPads in the Classroom.